Spelling IT, we can start. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. All persons having business before the Honorable, the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit are admonished to draw near and give their attention for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Case number 20-1062 et al. Oklahoma Gas and Electric Company petitioner versus Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Mr. Longstreth for the petitioner, Oklahoma Gas and Electric Company. Mr. Binet for the petitioner, Southwest Power Pole Inc. Ms. Pacella for the respondents. Mr. Lowell for the interveners for the respondents. Mr. Longstreth is now unmuted. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you and may it please the court. I'm John Longstreth. I'll be arguing for Oklahoma Gas and Electric, OG&E, and Mr. Bennett will be arguing for the co-petitioner at Southwest Power Pool, or SPP, which administers the tariff at issue in this case. In this case- Have the, have the two of you divided up the issues in any way? Um, I, I think yes, so, although um, obviously I'll be ready to answer uh, questions if I have it, but we've decided that uh, Mr. Bennett will be primarily um, responsible for the tariff issues um, because it's FPP's tariff. Okay. And you're going to do the, yeah. all right, go ahead then. Thank you. Uh, yeah. In, in this case, the, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in this case, the commission for, oh, and I'm sorry, one other thing, um, the section 309 remedy issues, um, which were at the end of our brief, Mr. Bennett is going to take the lead on those as well. Um, in this case, the commission first allowed, then refused to allow SPP to implement a provision of its tariff during a per period during which, with the knowledge and participation of all of its stakeholders, including Excel and AEP, SPP was determining the charges due under that tariff. That provision is known as Attachment Z2, and it was a filed rate under the SPP tariff throughout this period, with only the charges remaining to be determined. In reliance on that filed rate, OG&E and other utilities, many of whom are interveners here, spent hundreds of millions of dollars to build transmission facilities to carry wind power to population centers in Oklahoma and other states. As two of the commissioners recognized and reluctantly going along with the reversal orders here, the commission's position creates a huge windfall to some market participants who take service under the upgrades we built without having to pay for it. And a huge- well, let me, can, I, can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, yes. I wanted to ask you this question, but your sentence uh, caused me to ask it now. Okay. Um, in, in their brief, the responding interveners, they say, it is not a question of whether the funders will receive reimbursement, but mm -hmm. when. In other words, mm -hmm. they're saying that, that this case is only about whether payment will be now or over a period of time in the future. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, we do not but, believe- In other words, they're saying there is no windfall. It's just, the, the question is just when. Well, I, I think the, the first immediate answer to that question is we're going to have to pay back. If these orders are implemented, um, as the commission seems to be suggesting, we're going to have to pay tens of millions of dollars back with interest to these respondents. Um, but, it's going to be a but, windfall but, when they but, receive those tens of millions of dollars I still don't back. Get, I still don't get the windfall. Where, where's the windfall? Right. Well, I mean, for, I, I don't understand the windfall. They, As I read the uh, Z2, that's what they say here. They say, I didn't read you the rest of the sentence. It says, it says the reason it's just a, there's no windfalls because FERC's orders do not preclude such entities from being eligible to receive reimbursement prospectively and continuously until they receive full reimbursement. Is that not accurate? Um, I, I think it's not. I think there are two answers to that, Your Honor. And, and this is also something, by the way, that the implementation of Z2 is very, very complicated. Would you and, just stick? Would you, would you stick with this question? Just right. Help the us, answer is help we don't the know. Understand just this question, which is, yes. as I understand it, this is this is under attachment Z2. Mm -hmm. The uh, they'll be they'll be fully reimbursed. We may, there's no guarantee that we will be fully reimbursed. We will Why not? Be, we will be, because um, 
We don't know exactly um, who is going to take service in the future under this. Um, for example, the lines are fully subscribed now, Z2 uh, allows payment from future customers. Um, it's a very complicated process in which perhaps over the next 30 or 40 years we'll recover all of it. We don't know that for sure until we see exactly how it's implemented. The one thing we do know for sure is that if these, if these orders are affirmed, we will have to pay back all the money that was paid to us for the service provided under this historical period. Z, with, Z2, with is, an part uncertain, Z, Z2 is part of the tariff, right? That's correct. Well, then wouldn't it wouldn't it violate the tariff for you not to be fully reimbursed? Um, well, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry, I don't want to get too far into this. Obviously, we would obviously if this um, decision goes against us, we would like to think that sometime in the future we'll get whenever that is, we'll get all that money back. But we just at this point, I don't think have any clear um, knowledge that that will absolutely happen because of the way the tariff works. It's, and I, I guess all I can say is it's a very complicated process that requires the SPP to determine who is going to be using that, um, that facility in the future and then do the calculations of the payment. And of course, I, I think in our case, it's a couple hundred million dollars. Um, yes, we're entitled to keep collecting until we get it back you know, decades in the future, Perhaps, but we have no guarantee that we're we'll saying decades that though. only paid back with, with interest. Keep saying right? decades. I'm with sorry. Interest. With interest, right? Um, I, I think that's an issue that's being disputed between the parties. Um, Wait, as, what about what about yeah, Judge Walker's? What about Judge Walker's question? Where is the? Well, you just keep saying you just keep saying decades, but it took eight years to accumulate this much money. Why would it take a lot longer than eight years? to accumulate it again? Uh, because we've only collected a portion of it and uh, uh, we've only collected a portion of it that then has to be um, allocated in the future. Um, and again, um, I admit I, I have not worked out all of the calculations future. All I know is, and this is why the implementation has been delayed at FERC while we're, while we're waiting to determine whether we have to pay back the money to start with, is it's going to be an extremely complicated process to figure out exactly how and when we, were going to, we're, we will be able to get that money paid back in the future if we have to pay it back. If we have to pay it back now. Yes, I mean, you know, Frankie, yes, we are hoping that if we have to pay the money back, that will be put in and we'll be able to get some of it back in the future. I just can't tell you as I sit here today that we're guaranteed to get all of that back going forward. Mr. Mr. Longstreth, can you um, help me understand how the upgrade charges are passed along? So FERC says that um, upgrade costs arise when transmission occurs. So if these upgrade charges had been passed along in the monthly bills, like what is the connection between those charges and the transmission in terms of the billing? Like how do they, how do they work together? Okay. Um, again, I, and I, again, this is starting to get into the complexities of the tariff and it may be that Mr. Bennett is in a better position to talk about um, exactly how that works out. Um, but uh, well, I think, it's, I think it's important for the terms, right? Because there's, there's a sense in which on the plain meaning an upgrade charge sounds like mm -hmm. something different than a transmission rate. Right. I mean, and the upgrade charges are for, you know, reimbursements for infrastructure, whatever infrastructure means, you well, know, investments, but, um, you know, whereas, yeah. whereas transmission rates are for the actual transmission of, of the energy. So I guess I'm just, I'm trying to understand how those things are connected. No. And, and well, I mean, this, this is transmission. So um, it, it's just basically a different way to pay for the transmission. The problem here was that um, uh, they needed a new mechanism for um, allocating allocating the cost of this transmission that was constructed because we didn't have an identifiable customer base. You have a situation where the wind power is out in West, in our case, in Western Oklahoma, the population centers are in Eastern Oklahoma. And we, what we have to do is sort of build, build it on spec. And so OG&E is putting the money forward to build this. 
Um, it's going to be using it, but then there are going to be other customers using it. We don't know who those are until we build it. So attachment Z2 was basically a different mechanism to allow us to collect for the transmission, but it's still transmission. It's transmission, their transmission facilities, their infrastructure, they're put on the grid just like any other transmission facilities. It's just that because when those trans transmission facilities were built, we didn't know who the customers were going to be. We had to have this new mechanism, kind of an innovative mechanism like FERC said it wanted later under Order 1000, to make sure that this transmission was built so that the wind power could get carried. That explanation then seems to undercut your argument that 171 doesn't apply to Z2. Um, I, 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 well, I, I hope it doesn't, Your Honor. I don't think it does. I mean, 171 um, is... Uh, I mean, 171 is just not applicable here in our view because there was no actual data available at the time um, until they build it in 2016. So, um, you know, that I don't understand um, why the fact that it's transmission or not transmission goes to that issue. What 171 says is that there, SPP is required to build within, I'm sorry, required to build within one year of the time the actual data is made available. The actual data was made available in 2016, and that's when they build. So we never thought really that there was a 171 problem to start with, and no one else did either. One of the interesting things about this case is no one raised 171 at this time when all of the stakeholders were figuring out how to charge for the energy, the, uh, the transmission service that was being taken during this period that SPP was working out, no one raised their hand and said, 171 makes all of this a charade and no one ever is going to get paid for this eight year period that we're working this out. It, it was only raised after the fact. And to me, that's fairly powerful evidence that as we argue, 171 was never intended to apply to this situation where SPP couldn't figure out how much to charge until they were worked out how to implement this new um, how to implement this new collection uh, uh, system, this, this new uh, provision. Can I just ask, would Oklahoma Gas have a separate contractual claim against SPP if it doesn't recover? Um, we uh, we have, um, and uh, obviously this is, yes, we do. And as a matter of fact, we have brought a complaint against SPP. Um, of course, that complaint will probably go away if there's a reversal here because we'll get the money that we were entitled to under the tariff and under the contract. Yes, we have a separate contractual claim. Um, yes, Mr. Bennett will tell you they are vigorously opposing that claim. In, in no small part because SPP is a pass-through entity. They collect the money and then from the uh, customers and, and then give it back. So their view is we could have a claim against them for a $20 million and Mr. Burnett will tell you, how do we pay this? We're a pass-through entity. We'd have to charge the market for it somehow. And our view is you should charge the people who use the service. That's what, that's what we're here you know, for. I need to take you back to one of your answers to Judge Rao. I just didn't I quite understand what you say. Were you saying when she asked you whether or not uh, 1.7.1 applies here yeah. or whether Z2 covered, it, aren't, aren't Z2 charges, you're not arguing that Z2 charges aren't charge it, quote, charges for services out of the tariff, right? They are, aren't they? Yeah, that, that is correct. That's correct. So then I don't understand your argument that this isn't covered by 1.7.1. Um, well, I mean, it's covered by 1.7.1. I'm sorry, you're right. I, uh, I guess what I meant by applicability is, is it's not that 1.7.1 doesn't apply to transmission charges. These are transmission charges. It does, yeah. We're, we're, we're saying, I guess a better way to have said it, you're right, Your Honor, is, you know, the provision is applicable to charges for transmission service, but it doesn't act as a bar here. It doesn't, it, when I say it doesn't apply, it doesn't. It didn't require a waiver here, as SPP said. They said they were doing it as a uh, out of abundance of caution because, in fact, there was no violation of 171. 171 requires the payment within a year after the actual data is available. The actual data was not available until 2016. 2016. So you're right when we say an app. Like, but, well, what about the commission? Part, the, I'm the sorry. Commission is interpreted. The commission says that I'm confused about why you think a waiver wasn't needed. The, the, 
the under the under 1.171 supposed to, the invoices are supposed to be submitted quote for the charges the charges for all services under the tariff during the preceding month during right. the preceding right. month right these these were not ch charges during the preceding month that's why a well, waiver was called. am i missing well, something um, yeah, I think so, because that provision, you know, FERC, FERC uh, well, I, I probably should have said that better, too. But no, I, I think that it's two separate paragraphs. So the invoices have to be issued um, and uh, uh, the invoices have to be issued. But there's nothing that says those invoices can't be corrected as actual data becomes available later. The time bar is that this isn't this isn't that kind of case, is it? This isn't an inadequate data case, is it? Uh, well, I think it's exactly an adequate data case because the whole point of this was that SPP did not have the data to know how much to charge for this service. That's what the period of time, and it, it obviously went on longer than anybody wanted, including us who wasn't getting paid. But that was the whole point. The data wasn't available until um, until 2016. I mean, I think with all due respect, I think the commission kind of confused the issue a little bit by pointing to these invoices and the monthly invoices. Um, the point of that is, yes, we issue, uh, SPP issues the invoices every month, but there's nothing in that invoice procedure that bars SPP from coming and billing uh, later when it has the actual data. That time bar provision that they're really hanging their hat on, that's in the separate paragraph. And that separate paragraph makes clear that the one-year bar does not start until the actual... Yeah, I, I agree with you about that. I, I, I think you're right about that. But, but, the, but the commission is relying on the, quote, during the preceding month language. That's their... Yeah, they are. And, and you, you have to... I, this, this is an interpretation of a tariff, so... You know, our deference to the commission in these tariff cases is pretty deep. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm, to say that that's an unreasonable interpretation. Well, no, I think we have to say that it violates. Well, I, I mean, that is one thing we can say. I think what we are also saying very clearly, and we said it very clearly to FERC, and FERC didn't deal with it, is that under the plain meaning of the tariff, um, the one-year bar, and that's what's really at issue here. What's at issue here is because FERC let us go back one year. In 2016, they let us go back one year. They said you can't go back further because of this one-year bar. The problem with FERC reasoning is that the one-year bar doesn't start until actual data is available, and the actual data wasn't available until 2016. Okay. You're, we made that argument, SPP made that argument specifically to FERC, and they never dealt with it. If you look at paragraph 21 of the rehearing order, they're talking about something completely different. They never deal with that plain meaning argument. So right. since Council, they didn't deal with it, you don't have to defer to them. I understand. You're, unless either of my colleagues has any questions, you're well over time. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bennett. Uh, yes, good morning, Your Honor. I may please the court. Matt Bennett uh, arguing on behalf of Petitioner Southwest Power Pool Inc. And I'd like to begin with uh, Judge Tatel, your first question regarding uh, whether this is really a matter of timing of recovery versus recovery overall. Um, I think the interveners on FERC side are wrong about the, this being only an issue of timing for several reasons, one of which is that um, Attachment Z2 does not actually guarantee full 100% recovery. What it guarantees is eligibility to recover from those customers who, who subsequent transmission service requests require that line in order to provide that service. And so once that condition is met, uh, the project sponsors are eligible for, for, for their reimbursement. However, those reimbursements under Attachment Z2 for network transmission service are based on annual revenue requirements of those projects. And so if you have a year, if you have an annual revenue requirement for a certain year, but you don't collect any revenues to, to fulfill that revenue requirement, that revenue requirement is essentially gone. So for years where OG&E had a revenue requirement, for example, for their wind speed transmission project, but that project was not receiving any sort of attachment C2 credits, those revenue requirements are effectively gone. So uh, while there is no guarantee under attachment Z2 that even if we had implemented it on time, OG&E would be 100% compensated, um, the fact that FERC has essentially removed 
seven years worth of their eligibility for attachment Z2 credits makes it even much harder for them to be re reimbursed, which is exactly what the tariff anticipates and, uh, and is intended to fulfill. Um, so, so really, they, there is harm for OGE and other project sponsors here because their their uh, ability to get attachment Z2 credits and, and be reimbursed is is made much harder under this order. Um, and, and to get to, to Judge Rao's question to Mr. Longstreth about uh, charges versus rates, um, it, these, these tariff rates are incredibly complex and they include multiple components. Um, you know, customers pay for a portion of the transmission owners existing legacy facilities that have been in service for 50 years. They pay for these upgrades that uh, project sponsors like OG&E provide to SPP. They're also paying for projects that are planned by SPP and cost allocated around the region. So, you know, to say that, that these charges are separate from rates, I don't think is, is a fair characterization. However, um, and, and this, this really speaks to the last issue that Mr. Longstreth uh, was well, discussing. I, Mr. Bennett, if I can just ask you, I guess maybe my question was also our, I mean, Z2 talks about revenue credits Right, so are revenue credits also part of service transmission? Because it sounds yes. like something different, you know, just to me not being a, a FERC expert. Um, yeah, so, so the revenue credits are SPP's mechanism to pay these project sponsors back. So a transmission owner um, that, that owns the traditional transmission facilities that FPP provide service them. They provide SPP with an annual revenue requirement. And then there's a formula in the tariff that determines how those transmission customers, those transmission owners receive a portion of the money SPP takes in. And it's based on various, you know, formulas set forth in the tariff. So for, for project sponsors like OG&E, the mechanism to compensate them is the revenue credit. But what we collect from the customer is what we call the credit payment obligation. Uh, I don't believe that's a term that's defined in the tariff, but that is a term that we, that we use in our briefs and in our fittings to FERC below. So we collect those credit payment obligations based on attachment Z2 and based on this complex system that we developed to, to, uh, to calculate. And, those and, and you, you agree with Mr. Longstreth that all of that is encompassed in 171's charges for all services furnished under the tariff. Well, those are a component of tariff of transmission service charges. Yes. Okay. And, and so I think that is, that is correct. And so if you read the first sentence of section 1.7.1 in isolation, which is what FERC does in their orders and in, in their briefs. Yes. It says that SPP is required to furnish a bill. Um, but it does say for charges for, for all services, it does not say for all charges or else those charges are forever forfeited. In order to look for the time so limit, that, that is really that is my question in part, right? Is whether these credits are services furnished under the tariff during that month? I, yes, the credits pay for service that was provided over OG&E's transmission line. But in order to get to the when SPP can no longer recover those charges, you really need to look at the second paragraph that, that has the one year time provision, and that time provision unambiguously, in our view, doesn't kick in until after SPP has rendered a bill reflecting the actual data. And as the, the, the long tortured history of this case lays out, SPP struggled for years, uh, first to determine how in detail to, to calculate those charges, and then subsequently had to go through two different software vendors in order to develop the complicated systems to actually make the chart. The, 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 the Commission relies on an earlier sentence in 171, but the during preceding month sentence. Right, and 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 that that. Why, why is that? Why is that? Why are the un, why is their interpretation of the tariff unreasonable? Their interpretation of the tariff is unreasonable because that sentence is really only talking. That's only really setting up how SPP bills. SPP. Wait, has it says. It says. Stores. Wait. Oh well, no. Wait. It says. It says. It says. Wait, let me get the line here. It says, um, um, okay, it says, the provide, it says, after the first day of each month, the provider shall submit an invoice to the customer for the charges for all services furnished under the tariff. Those are Z2, right? All services under the tariff, right? That's Z2. 
Well, Z, Z2 itself is not a service. I mean, Z2 is but, a component. But it, right. I understand that, but th they are services, services furnished under the tariff, right? Right, to the extent that, for, for example, XL took transmission service during a month, and that transmission uh -huh. service required a lot of different facilities to okay. provide but that. Whatever it is, whatever it is, it has to be billed. It, it, it has to be billed. It has, it, it has to be billed. It, it, those charges during the preceding month have to be billed within a reasonable amount of time, right? Isn't that what well, it says? What needs to be billed is the charges for Excel's transmission service. And, and that provision, and no one's denying that Excel received the bill. And I think the issue is, was, was that bill complete? Mm. And that sentence does not talk about the completeness of the bill. It, all it says is for all services. Excel took transmission service. If they took point-to-point -point service and network service, those would be two different transmission services, but they were both billed in that same bill. But so, just, I don't want to belabor this. I don't want to belabor this. Maybe you just try once more, humor me here. Our, our expenditures under Z2 for, quote, services furnished under the tariff, and, and so Excel received a bill for no, the service. No, I, I didn't hear they, your answer. Are, are they, I didn't are hear they not? Quote. Oh, I apologize. I apologize. Can you hear me better? Now, I got you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, they, they are, right? Or are they not? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you. And, and Can I, I pick up it, on, sure. go ahead, but then I have a follow-up question. I was, I was just going to say that I know that I'm, I'm over time here yes. um, and I, did, I did reserve time for rebuttal, but I, I think that even if, even if the court determines that, that SPP's interpretation of the tariff is erroneous, I still think that, um, you know, we do have our arguments regarding notice. I mean, these, these customers right. participated for yeah. years in stakeholder right. processes and are now claiming surprise at the end of the process. Sure. Let, yeah. me, let me ask one hypothetical that's, that follows up on, on Judge Taylor's line of questioning. Take this first sentence from 171 that, that, the, that you've been discussing um, and imagine it's a cable bill. Imagine I'm the cable customer and Comcast, let's say is the cable company. And the, the rule is that within a reasonable time after the first day of each month, Comcast shall submit an invoice to the customer for the charges for all services furnished under the tariff during the preceding month. Now, if we just look at that, then I, as a cable customer, have to get my bill for April sometime in May. And now along comes Z2, and you're saying, well, Z2 changes that. D2 allows Comcast to bill me for some charge in, that was for a service in April of 2020, and they can bill me in April of 2028. There's something in Z2 that allows that. And, and my, if, if that's what you're saying, my question to you is point me to the text in Z2 that allows that. And I, I appreciate that. It's, it's not actually the text that's in Z2, Your Honor. It's actually the text that's in section 1.7.1 1. 1 in the second paragraph, which says that the one year clock does not begin to run until SPP has rendered the bill reflecting the actual data. Because SPP didn't have okay, that. So, I, so let me read that because I, I was billing adjustments for reasons other than A or B uh, shall be limited to those corrections and adjustments found to be appropriate for such service within one year after the rendition of the bill reflecting the actual data for such service. So which exception do you think that this falls under, A or B? It doesn't fall under either exception, Your Honor. It, 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 well, it, it's the general that, then, rule that that the bills reflecting actual data were not actually rendered until 2016 because prior to that, SPP lacked the ability to calculate that data. All right, but then that just takes us back to the preceding paragraph, which says you have to submit either actual data or estimated data within a reasonable time after the first day of each month. Respectfully, it does not say that. It says that SPP has to render a bill for the service. <laughs> It does not say that that bill is, is final or that that bill necessarily has to reflect, <clears throat> excuse me, each and every charge. That's, that's why we have the actual data language, 
but if that data is available later, we can we can include that in the bill. And, and the second part of the paragraph on section on the second part of the first paragraph of section 1.7.1 says that invoices may be issued using estimated data. It doesn't say that they have to be issued using estimated data. So okay, um, well, but no, it says to the. Oh, go ahead. Then no, no, I know we're, I, ahead, I know we're over. I, we're, I, we're well over time. Are you I'm, finished? I'm good I mean, I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, no, I'm, just, I'm good. You Thank okay? you. Though. All right. Naomi, you got anything? Uh, no, that's fine. Okay, Thanks. great. All right. Uh, we'll hear from the commission. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm hoping you can hear me. Thank Good you. Good morning. Um, I'm, I'm going to start with this actual data language in um, billing procedure um, 1.7.1. If you look at the estimated data um, set sentence in the first paragraph of 1.7.1, which says invoices may be issued using estimated data to the extent actual data is not available by the fifth working day of the month following service. And then it says adjustments reflecting the difference in billing between the estimated and actual data will be included on the next regular invoice. Again, following on with the you have to get this all done within a month. If you have to use estimated data, you can use estimated data, but you have to provide the actual data um, in the next month. And then the next paragraph, which talks about the one year time limit, says that billing adjustments for reasons other than those two exceptions that don't apply shall be limited to those corrections and adjustments found to be appropriate for such service within one year after rendition of the bill reflecting the actual data for such service. Actual data there refers back to the short time period after which you replaced actual data, the estimated data with actual data, all happening in a very short time period, not a matter of years. Um, so that's what the actual data is talking about here, not actual data you can sit and wait for eight years and come up with actual data and then come back and have these bills be not final this entire time. So I, I'm hoping that that resolves what actual data is about. In, in og &E's reply brief, they've, which is on, on uh, they have some block, a block quote on page six. And I wondered if, if you could, um, if you could reply to their reply here um, they're quoting Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, which itself is quoting natural gas clearinghouse. And it's, it's two sentences. Uh, so long as the parties had adequate notice that surcharges might be imposed in the future, imposition of surcharge does not violate the filed rate doctrine. The filed rate doctrine simply does not extend to cases in which buyers are on adequate notice that resolution of some specific issue may cause a later adjustment to the rate being collected at the time of service. I suspect that that you you have a way that you you can distinguish that case. I'm um, sorry, I didn't I didn't actually find the quote, but I think I understood what you were talking about, Your Honor. Um, I, I, I the commission found that there was not actual there was not adequate notice here to satisfy the filed right doctrine or retroactive rate making requirement. I'm, I'm a little bit confused on that too, uh, because on, on the next two pages of their reply, and maybe I have the page numbers wrong, but I think it's seven and eight that I'm on now. They've got two quotes from, from your brief that seem to be in some tension. Um, so I'll read the two quotes. One of the quotes is talking about upgrade sponsors. And it says they could not reasonably have expected that their upgrade costs would be reimbursed. So mm -hmm. that's what you just said a moment ago. Mm -hmm. But then it looks like there's also a quote saying, customers may have been aware from the stakeholder proceedings and study report negotiations that SPP ultimately intended to implement the crediting procedure retroactively for the historical period. So do you see the tension there and how do you resolve that? No, I, I, there is no tension there, Your Honor. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry if uh, my brief caused, caused some confusion. Um, no, the commission's point was there's, there can be notice and there can be notice that's adequate to satisfy the filed rate doctrine or, or uh, the rule against retroactive rate making. And so while there might have been notice that that was SPP's intent, SPP's statements, um, one-sided statement saying that 
is not sufficient. What the court has found, what this court has found is that, um, what this court has found is that um, matters that are not on file with the commission do not satisfy um, the notice required for the filed rate doctrine. Again, Federal Power Act Section 205D um, requires that all um, rates be on file with the commission and any changes to those rates be on file with the commission. So, I mean, not just rates, but rules as well. Yes, Your Honor. So, so adequate notice means notice provided through some type of filing with FERC. That, that is one of the ways to do it. There are other ways, none of which applies here as well. Um, if, for example, if there's a judicial proceeding right. regarding the matter. Right. Or it's a, a formula. A or something. proceeding or it's a formula or if actual, there's a- Actual notice is not enough. Actual notice could be enough. It's not necessarily enough, Your Honor. Okay, that's helpful. Can I, can I take you back to the debate we were having about whether this case is just about timing of payment? Do you yes, Your Honor. Sure, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. What the tariff provision provides, what Z2 provides, if you look at um, page A11 of the petitioner's brief, on um, the opening brief, the very first sentence says, an upgrade sponsor shall be eligible to receive revenue credits in accordance with Z2. And then the next sentence says, costs are recoverable from new transmission service using the facility as defined until the amount owed the upgrade sponsor is zero. So, right. so it's just all about timing, right? It, it is all about timing. And if there are concerns that um, because of the way Article Z2 is formulated now that in the future, um, uh, upgrade sponsors won't be able to fully recover, which of course they weren't promised that in the first place, but they were just promised eligibility. But if there are problems because of this revenue requirement um, issue, which I confess, I don't really understand what the issue is, but even if that's true, Z2 has been changed before and Z2 can be changed again. So if, there's, if, if it's now based on these revenue requirements that might cause a problem with um, for fuller recovery of the costs um, upgrade sponsors paid. Z2 was changed in 2013. I believe it was changed in 2015. It can be changed again to, to take care of that problem. Um, and I'm sure that the commission would entertain a filing um, to make a change such as that as long as the commission found it to be just and reasonable. So well, can I ask you, um... Are there any differences in treatment um, under the filed rate doctrine between rate terms and non-rate terms? I mean, it seems to be the commission's position that there is not, but there That's are right, some Your earlier Honor. decisions of the commission in Old Dominion itself. The underlying you know, decision drew the possibility that there could be some distinction between rate and non-rate terms. Is that no longer the position of the commission? Um, I, would, I, I, I would say that as a general matter, I think that's probably true. I'm not saying that there is no non-rate term the commission, wanted. I can't really speak for the commission in that sense, but I think the point is the filed rate is the filed rate. And um, rates include um, the requirement to have filed, have filings with the commission is not limited to rates themselves, but to all of the rules and other things that go along with that, that would not, not necessarily be considered rate. And so, so the commission's, so the commission previously was granting waivers as it did in this case, right? Which would right. allow for a form of retroactive rates to be applied. And so, so the commission's position now is that that is inconsistent with the statute. I think the commission also issued, it, you're absolutely right, Your Honor, no question the commission issued orders in which it addressed just its four waiver um, considerations without addressing the filed rate doctrine and made mistakes doing so. And the commission has said so in its policy, its proposed policy statement um, that the, is mentioned in the petitioner's brief. And um, what the commission there said is, is, you know, it's worth hearing. I think the commission says um, a pa paragraph one of the proposed policy statement at 171 FERC 61156. The commission's waiver orders have sometimes drifted beyond the limits imposed by the filed rate doctrine and the rule against retroactive rate making. And what the commission is proposed to do now is to, um, in paragraph 19 of that order, it, it says it will apply the four part 
um, waiver analysis, but only in circumstances where it can determine that the filed rate doctrine and the retroactive um, rule against retroactive rate ma- making won't be um, violated. So, so my question is, is FERC retroactively applying that new determination here to Oklahoma gas? Because, because the only reason this went to FERC on remand was in light of Old Dominion right? Our, this court's decision in Old Dominion. But but that decision didn't change the things that you have just discussed FERC changed in its policy statement. So this was opened up on remand, um, but it doesn't seem that FERC was really addressing anything that happened in Old Dominion. It was just making a policy change, you know, or a legal interpretive change about its authority under the filed rate doctrine, which it's now applying in a sense retroactively to these parties. Um, I I don't think that's exactly right, Your Honor. Um, What the commission was reminded by from from Old Dominion coming out, and again, remember, Old Dominion affirmed the commission's determination not to allow a tariff waiver because of the filed rate doctrine. So the commission just was reminded, oh my gosh, we we have a situation where we have a protest here. Um, we have somebody bringing us to court. We do not have a defense for this. So it's not a matter, it's literally the commission now complying with what this court's precedent already has said for a long time. And, and many of FERC's decisions have said for a long time. Sometimes we just didn't comply with the filed rate doctrine in our orders. And we recognize that now. And we're not going to continue to do so that. So are you going to go back and reopen other decisions that were made um, granting waivers in, in similar circumstances? I mean, I guess I'm wondering why these parties have their proceedings reopened in this circumstance. So, I mean, the commission, it, of course, not- is allowed to take a different position and explain itself reasonably. Um, I'm not suggesting it doesn't have the authority to do that. But, um, but what about applying it to these parties who had already previously received a waiver? Um, Your Honor, that was pending litigation. So this isn't a reopening of the case. The case was still pending in litigation. So there was no finality to the commission's orders yet. The commission had issued what were final orders and asked for it back because the case was still open. So this isn't a circumstance where there there was no court proceeding. The orders were final. Weren't the orders final with respect to FERC? I mean, there was litigation in this court, but that doesn't make make the commission's decision not final, does it? The commission was faced with a circumstance of having to to defend indefensible orders is really what it came down to. to. To grant waiver here without considering filed rate doctrine um, concerns that are, were readily apparent and, and um, the commission found it indefensible. I mean, that's why the commission brings back its orders because it thinks that something needs to be reconsidered. And the commission does not believe that that decision was made correctly. So this again, wasn't, it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't final. The order stopped being final once an appeal is, is made. Um, it's true, once we filed the record, the commission could no longer issue an order without asking for the case to come back to the commission. But the orders were no longer final orders in the sense that that they could not, uh, uh, the commission couldn't then reconsider its decision with leave of the court. And the court granted that leave. Right, it was unopposed by the parties. It was right? unopposed. Um, Judge Ryan, were you done? Yes, so, I am, thank you. Answer. Judge Walker, you have anything? If okay. I could ask we'll one question. No, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Along go ahead. just along those lines, uh, OGE or the petitioner's reply at, at page 14 says you're continuing to grant these types of waivers with retroactive application using a, the four factor test without mentioning uh, notice or the filed rate doctrine. They say you're continuing to grant those type of waivers as recently as last Friday. Uh, so, is that true? So, so, um, the, this court's precedent in Brooklyn Union Gas, um, which is, excuse me, Your Honor, 409 F3rd 404 at 406 says that um, the court does not consider post record commission orders in determining whether the orders before the court are, um, are reasonable. So, um, all those orders, it is true, the commission did issue the orders um, in those circumstances without considering um, the filed rate doctrine matters. Um, 
in each of those cases, there was um, there were no protests filed and no rehearing requests were filed. But I wouldn't want to have had to defend those cases in court either. So, um, I, I, you know, and the commission has issued this proposed policy statement, which is still in flux. Um, it, it hasn't been finalized yet. And I, I'm speaking completely out of my, I think maybe the court the commission's waiting. I have no idea, but maybe they're waiting for this decision to come out um, and get a, you know, a ruling okay. from the court. Okay. Uh Thank you. Uh, we'll hear from Mr. Lowell. May it please the court. My name is Joseph Lowell and I am counsel for Excel Energy Services and speaking today on behalf of the interveners for respondent. The interveners for respondent request that the court deny the petition for review of FERC's order. Each of the uh, Interveners on behalf of respondent are transmission service customers within SPP. Each of the uh, interveners uh, agreed to take transmission service from SPP, um, entered into service agreements with SPP for the transmission service, and then pursuant to the waiver orders will retroactively build um, for attachment Z2 credits in violation of section 7.1 of the SPP tariff. Um, now to be clear, uh, we interpret 7.1 7 as prohibiting any cost components of transmission service that should have been included in the bill to be billed beyond one year. Um, these were transmission service charges um, that SPP was seeking to resettle um, they, their waiver, original waiver application makes this clear. They discussed reviewing all of the transmission service that had occurred back to 2005. They discussed calling back revenues from transmission service that were provided to other transmission owners. Um, and so this was a uh, prohibited resettlement of transmission service charges going back all the way to 2008. A, a primary issue in this case is, is the notice issue. Um, now SVP and interveners on behalf of us uh, on the petitioner side have argued that um, parties had noticed all along that this, this was the plan, that there was gonna be a resettlement of all the attachment of all the transmission service charges to include the attachment Z2 component. And this is not the case. Um, it was their burden to demonstrate that such notice had been provided to FERC. Um, what they provided is essentially, um, their assertion that this was discussed during the stakeholder process. Um, they have, argued, they have pointed to statements that Excel Energy Services, we have made in our pleadings as further, as, as a concession that we were aware of this. Now, what was really happening was SPP did not know um, how to assess whether or not entities were using the attachment Z2 cr credible upgrade. And so there was, no one knew that anyone you know, that we were taking service over these facilities and should have had to pay for them. It's the service itself, or the, the, the way to identify the attachment Z2, the people who should be reimbursed and the people who should pay was determined well after the fact. Um, during the SPP stakeholder process, what was happening was we were, the stakeholders were trying to figure out a way to, to make the attachment Z2 credits work to identify the beneficiaries and the parties who should pay. Excel Energy Services did, did not understand, and it's true also for the other interveners on behalf of the respondent, that a resettlement going back up to eight years was contemplated as part of that. Excel Energy Services began to understand that in the second half of 2015, that 
having figured out how to identify the relevant parties, the parties who should be charged and the parties who should be compensated, um, that having figured that out through the software and, and the stakeholder process, the SVP intended to apply that backwards. We did not know ahead of time. It does seem hard to believe, Mr. Lowell, that if you're in a process discussing how these revenue credits are to be allocated over a period of time, that you wouldn't be on some kind of actual notice that you were liable for those for those costs of which you know the interveners enjoyed the benefits of that service. That does seem. I don't know that that's dispositive here, but it does seem like a. It does seem hard to imagine that there was no actual notice to the interveners. Well, attachment Z2, Your Honor, speaks of how for each new transmission service request that would use a credible upgrade, SVP will determine whether that service could be could not have been provided but for credible upgrade. Now, this task force or the SVP committees, one of which was called the Crediting Process Task Force, was trying to figure out how conceptually they could do that when there was given the volume of transmission service requests that were coming in. And keeping in mind that transmission customers in general pay a rolled in rate, uh, reflecting all the costs of this transmission system. And what we're trying to do here is isolate whether a new service could not be, could not be granted without that isolated facility to sponsor an upgrade. Um, um, that conceptually is difficult. Sorry. Um, any other questions from the Not for me. Okay. No. Thank you, Mr. Lowell. Let's see. Um, Mr. Longstreth and Mr. Bennett, you were both out of time, but you can each have one minute. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I'll, I'll try to be very quick. Um, well, one minute. Yeah, one minute. Yeah. Um, uh, Ms. Pasella said actual notice may be enough, but it's not always enough. She didn't What's not enough. I, I didn't she, say it again. Ms. Pasella said that actual notice may be enough, but it's not always enough. Mm -hmm. She hasn't cited any case. Nobody cited any case that people had actual notice that that's not enough. Old Dominion wasn't such a case. That was after the fact. West Deptford wasn't such a case. Here, the obligation was known to everybody. Did they have actual notice? Of course they had actual notice. Joint Appendix 398, Excel said in its pleading, was fully aware of SVP's intent to implement this retroactively. Um, the uh, working group, he mentioned the working group. We cited this in our brief. January 2014, quote, SVP must collect and pay all credits owed since May 2008. Record 32, page 5. We didn't put it in the appendix. But um, uh, one of the other protesters, there's a graph, 2011, the uh, market group, that all these people were part of. What's next? Credit due back to May 2008 when FERC approved the but for condition. Record 32, page five. Everybody knew. That's why we were there for years. Everybody knew this was going to be um, collected back to 2008. That was the whole point. There's not a single case that, that when people have that kind of actual notice, the filed rate doctrine prevents it from being collected. Um, FERC has been on the waivers. I'm sorry. Mr. 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 first year. You're over time again. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Bennett, go ahead. <clears throat> yes, thank you, Your Honor. And I, I would just pick up where Mr. Longstreth left off. Um, Ms. Pasella said that, that uh, actual notice is not available when there are one-sided statements from the RTO. This case does not involve one-side statements. These customers participated in years and years of stakeholder meetings. They have We have records of their voting to endorse the approach that SVP ultimately took based on the presentations that Mr. Longstreth mentioned. So this is not a case of SPP just saying, oh, we're going to bill you. But and Mr. these people Bennett, even if we assume that there was actual notice, can you point to a case in which the actual notice did not involve a filed rate with FERC where they took into account that actual notice? It seems to me that the cases that you cite involve notice involving some type of filing with FERC type of filing or some type of agreement however none of those cases say those are the only types of notice available but can and you can you cite a case in which notice was provided without a filing to FERC because no, I, I, I was not able to locate one but but perhaps there are some 
Not off the top of my head, Your Honor. And if I could just make one more quick point just to, to um, sort of pick up on what Judge Walker and Judge Rao were, were exploring. Um, FERC, is, FERC prior to SPP's waiver, and in fact prior to the Old Dominion waiver had previously granted, or the Old Dominion case rather, had previously granted waivers of this exact tariff provision. So these parties had noticed that FERC viewed it as waivable at the time. Uh, and FERC continues to this day to grant retroactive waivers. Right. We Mr. We, Mr. Bennett, we, we have an argument. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Yeah. Thank you all. The case is submitted. Please call the next case. Case number 19-7058, In Re Domestic Airline Travel Antitrust Litigation. Ms. St. John for the appellants, Ms. Edwards, Amicus Curie, Ms. Kenny for the appellees. Ms. St. John is not. Good morning. Good morning. May it please the court. Anna St. John on behalf of appellants Michael Frank Bednars and Theodore H. Frank. Frank and Bednars are objecting class members who are seeking to protect their rights to appeal the approval of two settlements that potentially provide them and other class members with zero relief. The class notice here specifically leaves open the possibility that the entire settlement fund after attorney's fees and class representative awards will be paid to third parties as site prey. The district court failed to analyze this distribution issue and the claims process as rule 23 B2C2 requires. Didn't the district court say that uh, the district court was doubtful there would be such an award, but if there would, there would be another order and additional notice? So the both class counsel and the district court did express the view that they were not inclined to have the settlement. No, no, but, no. My, my question was, didn't the district court say if there's going to be a Cypre award, there will be additional notice? Yes, Your Honor. The court did say that. Right. So doesn't that protect you? No, Your Honor, for two reasons. Mm -hmm. First, a right um, notice does not necessarily guarantee a right to opt out of the settlement or to object. And well, if you could challenge it, you could challenge it then when we have a real order. I mean, this may never happen, right? It's conceivable there'll never be a cipher award. That's right, Your Honor. But if this court yes. affirms final approval of the settlement, class members will have no recourse if, in fact, the settlement is all awarded to Cypre. And so the problem is- I don't that understand that. I, I don't understand that. Explain that to me. Okay. Yes, of course, Your Honor. If we, we don't know at this stage whether or not any settlement funds or all settlement funds will be paid to third parties at Cypre. Um, however, we if the court affirms the approval of the settlement here, then class members will not have an opportunity to opt out of the settlement. Their claims have will have been released, released and they, the settlement funds that represent their money, the value of their claims that were released, will go to organizations and causes that they, they may not wish to support. Um, you know, some of the biggest abuses in Cypre settlements is that funds go to organizations that the defendant is already donating to, which is essentially just a change in accounting entries. Um, it doesn't actually cost the defendant anything or it's an organization affiliated with class council, maybe an alma mater or an organization where they sit on the board of directors. And so having the opportunity to object and opt out addresses this conflict of interest and it allows class members to avoid having their money support causes they disagree with in violation of the first amendment. If the can, you, can, you try, can you try again though? What, 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 why can't you just object? to a, a Cypre order when there is a Cypre order. So even if a class member could object, that doesn't mean the court's going to agree with the objection. They still may be stuck having their money going to causes they don't want their money going to. Whereas if they can opt out of the settlement, they keep their claims. Their claims will not be released by the settlement and they can do what they want to with those claims. They can either just let them die or bring them in a separate lawsuit. You know, we have 
we have the issue here where the parties change their mind on another issue. Um, we saw the parties switch positions on the issue of finality before the district court. The court questioned both sides as to the need for, uh, or whether it could hold off on approving the settlements until the other defendants settled or otherwise resolved their cases so that it would have full information about the distribution of the funds. Class counsel and defendants were adamant that the lack of finality could jeopardize the settlement and the cooperation that defendants are providing under the settlement. Um, the settlement requires the, the parties to seek a 54B judgment and the proposed final approval order included language making 54B findings. The district court specifically relied on those representations about finality in its final approval order. Am I, sorry to interrupt you, but am I remembering uh, correctly that um, at a certain point in this appellate process, it was your position that we don't have jurisdiction um, and then now it's your position that we, we probably do, although if we don't, there's a certain way that you want us to say that. Um, if, if my memory is right, um, what, what accounts for the change of position? Well, we, we think it's ambiguous. Um, you know, under a strict reading of 1291 um, and 54B, we fully acknowledge that the district court did not make the findings under 54B that would allow an appeal of, of a partial um, a partial settlement to be appealed. Um, looking at it a little more closely and thinking about how this progresses, if we are not allowed to appeal now, you know, I don't think it's foreclosed entirely by the case law. I think that um, 1291 can be given a functional reading, especially under Gilboy v. Bank of America. But are there any that, cases giving it that type of functional reading in the circuit or the Supreme Court? Not this specific type of functional reading, Your Honor. There's, there's no case law directly on this issue. And that's what makes this a bit of a hard case for us. And, you know, we're really... I mean, so ordinarily parties who, who seek to appeal, they have a burden of establishing jurisdiction, but you're telling us that jurisdiction is uncertain. So have you not even met your burden of moving ahead with this appeal? Well, we have provided grounds on which there could be jurisdiction, but we want to be completely honest with the court in that there's no case law directly on point saying that there is definitively jurisdiction. So in, in our that's, view- That's true, sure, yeah. I was just agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Honor. We appreciate our, I mean, your candor. No, you you're being very candid. That's extremely helpful to us, but, but given that Judge Rao's question is pretty important, given that doubt, how can we find jurisdiction here? Well, I think that there are, um, arguments that do support jurisdiction, and I'm sure Amicus will address those more fully, but here there is a question of what happens to our appeal rights if the settlements with the remaining two defendants, Delta and United, don't go through in the MDL context. But Amicus doesn't have a burden of establishing jurisdiction. I mean, that's what we've asked them to do, um, and they have they have done that, but um, but it's it's your obligation, right? It's your it's your client's obligation to establish jurisdiction. Well, we've presented arguments on which we believe jurisdiction could be found. You know, we. What's your best? Tell us your best argument for jurisdiction. Our what best is argument is that the district court's order is con is called expressly a final approval order. It finally adjudicates all of the claims of two defendants in this case. Southwest and American are out of the case completely. Um, that's a, a final decision under 1291, except for the fact that we have this unique MDL context where there are two defendants still litigating claims uh, in the district court. So 1291 is, has been, precedent establishes that it should be given a flexible functional reading. And here you can definitely take the final approval order as a final decision from which class members appeal. We're using Zoom, meaning in front of Ms. St. John, could you have taken another procedural approach such as filing a protective appeal? Or is there some other mechanism you could have used in a situation like this where, where the timing for appeal was uncertain? We 
would welcome the interpretation of our appeal as a protective appeal. You know, we were we were very uncertain as to whether the parties were going to ask for a 50 B, 54B judgment and whether it would foreclose our rights to appeal at any point. We would we would welcome that approach. We would welcome bright line rules about when class member objectors and MDLs are required to appeal. Mm -hmm. It's you know the parties could change their positions later. And so we really were in a quandary about when to appeal and how to protect our appellate rights. Um, so, you know, if the court does hold that there is no jurisdiction, we do ask that it expressly state that the final approval order is not a final decision under 1291 so that we don't have collateral litigation uh, later over whether or not our appeal subsequent appeal timely and okay. um so you you said i understand your brief you feel you'll be completely protected if we enter an order saying we don't have jurisdiction because there's no final order here right that, partially that, there is so, the issue that if the mdl falls apart we don't know what would trigger the final decision from which we could subsequently appeal you mean if the cases all go back to the originating court Yes, Your Honor. Well, the cases are transferred back to the originating courts. Um, you know, is it the transfer order? Is it the first judgment in the in the separate cases that go back? It's it's well, unclear. Suppose, suppose, the clock. suppose our order says, you know, uh, there's no final judgment here, and we expect the district court should send the case back to the originating courts to enter a 54B order. Would that protect you? The order would state that if it were yeah, to it state, it state the order would state that our determination that it's not final is on the basis of the assumption that if it does go back to the originating courts, the district court will issue a 54B order. I think that would be very helpful, Your Honor. Okay. Right. okay. Uh, why don't we hear from Amicus since we're talking about jurisdiction? Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honor. Erica Hashimoto as court appointed amicus in support of jurisdiction. And with the court's permission, Hallie Edwards, a third year law student at Georgetown will make the argument in support of jurisdiction. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, your honors, and may it please the court. This court faces a novel question. In an MDL, is an order granting final approval to two settlement agreements with two out of four defendants, and then dismissing the settling defendants with prejudice, final under section 1291, allowing objectors to those settlement agreements to appeal now. Under the Supreme Court's decision in Gullboim, the answer is yes. Bednarz and Frank, the objectors, entered the litigation solely to object to the American and Southwest settlements. They are not parties to any of the 105 cases underlying the MDL. Under section 1407, those cases will be remanded to their originating districts at the close of pretrial proceedings. If the objectors cannot appeal the settlement determination now, <clears throat> they face an MDL specific quandary concerning the possibility of later appeal. Because they were not parties to any of those underlying cases, it is entirely unclear where or if or when they could appeal after the cases are remanded. In Gelboim, the Supreme Court recognized such jurisdictional quandaries can be solved with a simple solution, and that is immediate appeal. The order is final under 1291 <coughs> because it was titled a final order and fully resolved American and Southwest role in the litigation, dismissing them with prejudice and setting the money owed on their liability. This case, though, is is different from Gilboin. Um, the objectors here are not, they're, they're not plaintiffs. Uh, th that was a case where there was a, they dismissed a, one of the many cases. Here, the objectors are not parties to any case and they're not part of any of the underlying cases. And unlike in Gilboin, we have a consolidated complaint here. The case seems completely different from Gilboin to me. Um, is that, that not right? 
That's exactly right, Your Honor. This case is much more complicated than Gelboim. Bednarz and Frank are not plaintiffs. They are objectors to the litigation. But under the Supreme Court's holding a uh, decision in Devlin, objectors are parties to mm -hmm. appeals for the limited purpose of appealing settlement determinations. And they're not full-fledged parties to the underlying case. Moreover, under this... Go ahead. Oh, oh, no problem. Um, under this court's decision last year in Moloch v. Whole Foods, putative class members are not parties to litigation, which is important because vis-a-vis -vis the Delta and United litigation against which no classes have been certified, Bednarz and Frank have no connection. So those two things taken together, along with Delta, uh, American and Southwest finality, gives us finality under 1291 as to all claims and all parties relevant to Bednarz and Frank's objection within the MDL. And under Gelboim, the question of which claims and parties matter for the 1291 analysis is a practical determination building on Supreme Court case law that for decades has recognized a practical rather than a technical construction of 1291. And in Gullboim, the court recognized that the possibility of losing later appeal is a reason to find 1291 finality when those quandaries exist. Here, the quandary is pronounced as Bednarz and Frank, as your honor point out, are not plaintiffs, they are objectors. And under the settling parties theory of finality, if the cases are remanded to the originating courts in cases such as Hilvey Henderson, there's a real problem that some circuits may not find they have jurisdiction over the interlocutory order from the district court merging with the final order in a transfer or court. In McGeorge versus Continental Airlines, which is a 10th circuit case discussed extensively in Hill v. Henderson, which is one of the cases the settling parties cite for that proposition. The 10th Circuit found it did not have jurisdiction over claims that had been dismissed from an out-of-circuit district court and acknowledged that those claims were in quote hiatus. And this court in Hill v. Henderson acknowledged that those claims had been orphaned under that reading. And that's a problem here not only because one of the airline's cases originates in Oklahoma, but because it underscores the fact that in the event the cases are remanded, there's a real question as to whether every circuit would even find it has jurisdiction over the objector's appeal. So because of that specific quandary that exists under Galboim, we urge this court to find the district court's order as final under 1291 and exercise jurisdiction over the objector's appeal. Uh, thank you. Uh Unless my colleagues have any questions, thank you, Ms. Edwards. We'll thank you. Hear from, um, we will hear from um, Ms. Kenny. Good morning, uh, Janine Kenny for Appellees and Respondents. Uh, and may it please the court. Uh, Gail Boehm did not es establish a new practical construction for finality under section 1291. What Gail Boehm was explaining was why the rule of finality should not be suspended just because it's an MDL. It didn't deem the order that the district court issued in that case to be final. It found it was final. And then the question was, was there any reason to consider it non-final in that case? That's because there were three separate class actions pending in that case. Mm -hmm. uh, the cases cited by Amiki are not to the contrary, they all exa involve exactly the same circumstance. And that is where separate cases are proceeding before an MDL court, any final order disposing of all parties and all claims in those cases are final. So there's nothing remarkable about Gelboim and footnote five of that case makes pretty clear that the court is not, is not looking at a new practical construction. And of course, Mohawk Industries v. Carpenter makes very clear that uh, courts should exercise significant caution in any new practical construction of Section 1291. There's also no authority, as I think uh, appellants admit, that termination of a, a party or non-party's distinct role in a case has any application under Section 1291. 
1291, as the courts have interpreted it, uh, applies when the court disposes of all claims against all parties. And there's nothing left to do but execute the judgment or where the court completely disassociates itself from the case. The factors that the courts look at to evaluate finality, the intent of the court, for example, um, really applies only where the, there is an order that does apparently end all claims as against all parties, but there's some ambiguity to that order. And that's where the court looks to intent, where it's very clear that an order is interlocutory, as is very clear in this case, and I think everybody admits does not dispose of all claims at all parties. You don't look to intent and you don't look at, at how the court characterized the order and that's expressed in Rule 50 feet before. But let's suppose that even if Gilboyne did establish this rule that a non-final order could be deemed final if there were no opportunity to appeal. I want to address some of the practical concerns that have been raised and maybe uh, in the court's mind. There's no question that the objectors will have an opportunity to appeal in this court. And that's because of the nature of this action. The court made very clear the reason it was denying uh, finality under, or denying uh, entry of a Rule 54B judgment when we asked for it, and again, when uh, appellants asked for it, was because it believed that the objections raised were entirely premature and may, um, could be resolved later if they remain, or may be entirely mooted. And that's entirely with its in, within its discretion. And wh when those concerns, when it will be clear whether those concerns are uh, remain or are mooted is when the final amount for settlement distribution will be known. And that's what the court is waiting for to determine whether there are additional settlements or there is a judgment in this case, at which point it will be appropriate, that will be the appropriate time to distribute the settlement funds. There's nothing to suggest that when that opportunity arises, the court is going to deny a Rule 54 entry of Rule 54B judgment. Um, the, the, the amount for distribution in this case is going to be known under four circumstances. One, United and Delta settle and the case is over. No need for a 54B judgment. Second circumstance is we're in the middle of briefing summary judgment right now that will close shortly. We may lose on summary judgment. I don't think we will, but we may lose. And that will be final judgment as to this consolidated uh, amended complaint. And it will be clear that there will be no additional settlements and we will proceed with distribution then. Propose a plan, notice a plan, the court appellants can object to the plan and the court can accept or reject it. The third circumstance is that the class is certified. And when the class is certified, the case will proceed to trial and it will proceed to trial in this court. There's no opportunity for those individual cases to be remanded because they will be subsumed in the single nationwide class that the court certifies. So there's no, there's no issue with remand. And why will the class trial proceed here? Because plaintiffs filed a consolidated amended complaint that superseded their prior complaints. It pleaded proper venue here, venue was not objected to. We've consented to trial before this court. Even if that were not the case, the parties can always consent to trial before the MDL court. And in class action cases, that is what happens because the court has been presiding over the matter for a number of years. So that class case will proceed to trial here. And when that trial is over, we'll proceed, there'll be final judgment one way or the other, and we can proceed to distribute the funds, uh, including any uh, funds from judgment. The concern that appellants raise is, and amicus raise, really can only occur if the class is not certified. And if the class is not certified, it will also be clear that there is no opportunity for further class-wide settlements. Why? Because defendants don't settle on a class basis when a class has, when class certification has been declined. And at that point, the court would issue a Rule 54B judgment. Um, Going back to the certification of the class, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the uh, individual cases get subsumed. They get subsumed Kenny, unless- like, Ms. Kenny, yes. going back to your, your fourth hypothetical, or your, your fourth possibility, rather, um, what, if, what if the district court doesn't issue a 54B? If the court doesn't issue a 54B judgment, um, 
there are, there are several options. One, <clears throat> the parties could seek appeal of that decision, right? We could seek appeal under, by seeking a writ of mandamus. At that point, we'll wanna distribute the, the funds. We wanna get the, the, the settlement funds out to the class. Um, and, and certainly objectors will wanna appeal that decision. But it doesn't even need to come to that because there were cases filed directly in this court. They're not going anywhere. The consolidated amended complaint was, is filed in this court and that action isn't going anywhere. And one of the named plaintiffs in that action, Mr. Yaninas, filed his original complaint, which he amended with the consolidated amended complaint um, in this court. So that consolidated amended complaint, even if it proceeds on a non-class basis to trial or is voluntarily dismissed if class certification is denied, that will be decided in this court. And even if none of that was an option, there's an argument that the court's decision under this court's precedent under Ruber v. United States, um, that's 773 F. 3rd, 1367, may vest this court with appellate jurisdiction if all of the cases are transferred out. They all scatter to the wind. The court completely disassociates itself because the MDL is over. In Ruber, the court had, had held where um, there was a partial dismissal of parties and the, the case is transferred out of circuit for further proceedings that the court has appellate jurisdiction then. That case addressed section uh, transfer under 1404A, but the court could decide at that time that the rule applies to transfer out under section 1407 um, as well. But I think the larger point is because it is unlikely, in fact, uh, improbable that appellants won't have the opportunity to appeal a final judgment to this court from this district court, deciding whether there's jurisdiction on these facts is entirely premature. The court could decide at a later point whether or not uh, there needs to be a new practical construction, despite Mohawk's admonitions of section 1291, whether to extend Ruber um, to a section 1407 transfer and um, whether to issue a writ of mandamus if the court for whatever reason, declines to enter Rule 54B judgment. We have no reason to believe that Judge Kohler Catelli would not do so because she explained her rationale for not granting a Rule 54B judgment very clearly in her opinion on the motion to show cause. So for all of these reasons, this court does not have jurisdiction now. We don't have a final order. It's clearly interlocutory. Um, there's no exception under Gelboim that could possibly provide jurisdiction here. And even if there is a concern about appellant's opportunity to appeal, that concern is likely premature because none of the circumstances um, that they are concerned about have yet arisen. Thank you. Um, uh, if, if, I may, uh, do, if you have questions, I'd just like to address the merits very quickly. Uh, you're, way, you're way over time, I think. Um, so, so you can take one minute, go ahead, quickly. Okay, certainly. Um, one minute. Um, the, uh, if the court reaches the merits, we think the, the, this court should affirm. The, we think the papers make very clear and the record in this case makes very clear that the court considered, clearly considered the method of distributing the re relief to the class. Appellants just don't like the outcome. They disagree with the outcome and that does not establish abuse of discretion. Um, appellants also, contend that the lack of uh, specific notice regarding uh, the means of distribution in the notice was uh, abuse of discretion to approve that notice. They've established no case law that, uh, that requires that. And they don't dispute that we satisfied, the notice satisfied all of the criteria under rule 23C2. And on um, their Cypre complaint, their Cypre concern, what's your answer to that? Uh, the, the Cypre concern is entirely premature. We've made very clear to the court that we don't expect a Cypre distribution here, but we can't with 100% certainty rule it out. And, and if we had tried to rule it out, and we, so we told the class that, and we had to tell the class that so that they could exercise their option to opt out at that point in time. But, and had we told them that it would absolutely be pro rata, which is our intent, that would have misled them because if, in the unlikely uh, chance that there does need to be an all or partial Cypre settlement, they may have 
stayed in the class when they would have otherwise chosen to opt out. And so we told the class everything we could tell them based on the information we had at the time, the class will receive additional notice at the appropriate time. They will have the opportunity to object and any objections appellants have will be ripe for appeal then. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, uh, Ms. St. John's and Ms. St. John and Ms. Edward, you are both out of time, but you can each take one minute. Thank you, Your Honor. I wanna go back to Judge Rao's question about why we didn't file a protective appeal. Our, we, that's what we thought we were doing. We asked the court to hold the appeal in abeyance, and then we asked for the same order that we're asking for now, which is that if the court dismisses due to jurisdiction, you know, it can do so, but please make clear that the final approval order is not a final decision that would foreclose our appeal rights. Um, the court ordered full briefing and appointed amicus on the jurisdiction issue. And we had to pursue the appeal to avoid a later finding that we appealed too late, which has happened in other cases. So we've um, we believe we did file the protective appeal that was needed and we're, that's simply what we're doing here is trying to protect our appeal rights. Um, it's important that the court doesn't simply affirm because once the settlement is approved, certain rule 23 issues cannot be um, unwound or protected even simply through the objection right. If the settlement is all side prey, it raises issues with certification. Um, it raises the adequacy of representation issue with a class council or representatives who agreed to a settlement that's all side prey. And so there are rule 23 problems that infect the entire settlement. Um, and so that needs to be able to be unwound without um, a denying the class members to opt out. Thank, Thank you. you, your honors. Ms. Edwards. Thank you, your honor. Two quick points on rebuttal. First, we agree with counsel for Applebee's that Gelba William did not announce a new finality rule under 1291. What Gelba William had to determine was whether in a consolidated MDL case, which parties matter when asking the question of all claims and all parties within the MDL? The same defendants the Gelboim plaintiffs were litigating against continued to litigate in the MDL after their claims were dismissed. But the court looked at finality as to just the Gelboim plaintiffs because of those practical concerns. Second, counsel for Appleby's in tells a story about how exactly appeal would arise in this court, but it's necessarily speculative. And at every stage presented, including a 54B certification or um, the possibility of trial in the MDL court, there's a reason why that might not happen. 54B certification is discretionary. Under lexicon, plaintiffs can insist on remand to their originating courts. So for those reasons, uh, we urge the court to recognize the uncertainties at play here and find that this is final under 1291 and assert jurisdiction over the objector's appeal. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Edwards, you and your colleagues at Georgetown were appointed to serve as amicus and we're grateful to you for your assistance. The case is submitted. Thank you very much. This honorable court is now adjourned until Friday, April 16 at 9.30 a.m.